the reason that I became so interested in Horn and Hard Art was that I loved my college cafeteria very much. And while I was a student, I began researching in the school library the, the history of cafeterias because I was just really wondering where did this come from? And I, I hadn't... I hadn't really had a school cafeteria experience before. I went to Jewish day school and we had a kosher food truck. And I just loved sitting there, meeting new people. I never had to eat by myself, which was something that I, growing up, my parents uh, both worked uh, very kind of demanding jobs and very late. And I was often kind of on my own. So in my school cafeteria, I, I was just having a blast. So, and this project began uh, my finer, final quarter of uh, school. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody wants to know, how'd you get Mel Brooks? <laughs> In my college town, I was a 35 millimeter projectionist at a 1920s movie palace. And we brought in Carl Gottlieb, who was one of the writers of Jaws and we were projecting Jaws 3D and on 35 millimeter in 3D, you see have two projectors going simultaneously. And he, he and I became Facebook friends. And so when I did my Kickstarter campaign, Carl saw it on Facebook and he sent me a message saying, I'm, I loved Horn and Hard Art. It was such an important place for me. I'm going out for Chinese food with Mel Brooks tonight. Uh, do you mind if I mention your film to him? And so apparently that was a very good topic to bring up. And Mel, I was told he just couldn't stop talking about it, uh, all his memories. And so the next day I was in communication with Mel's assistant and uh, we organized very quickly for me to go to, I was living in Seattle at the time, to go to LA and uh, Mel recruited Carl. Um, he said, let me, I gotta get Carl to do this. And then Mel also got Carl to host the, instead of Mel having to host the interviews in his house, he got Carl to host the interviews too. So yeah, that's how it all happened. Wow, I've never heard that kind of story before. <laughs> this is, uh, oh, I see there's a little halo uh, up up there. And and how did you find all the other wonderful people? Did you just, you know, put that ad in the paper like they had partner wanted? Well, in addition to being the 35 millimeter projectionist at this theater, I was also the development director and I had to fundraise to convert our theater from 35 millimeter to digital cinema projection DCP. So I reached, I wanted, I wanted some celebrity to head up our campaign for us because I thought that would help make it easier. So I, uh, I had heard that Elliot Gould was a very generous person who agrees to, you know, do things for good causes. So I, I reached out to, uh, to him and he uh, agreed to be the face of our uh, you know, our kind of campaign to save the theater because a lot of theaters were going out of business at that time. And so while Elliot was up for our fundraisers and we did, you know, a, a week long tribute to Elliot Gould, we showed all his films. I remember him, I mean, it's like a, an 800, 900 seat theater. I remember him sitting in the very back row by himself uh, watching, uh, I don't know, was it, was it MASH? I think it was MASH. He was there and, uh, in fact, he, I, I have to call him back because he just called me. Um, call him now. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he called uh, last night just randomly to ask how the film was doing. And um, just fi he wanted, I think everybody's asking him, like, what's going to happen with the film? And he wanted to know what to be able to tell people. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there might be a few other filmmakers in the audience, but we've all had the experience of friends saying, oh, you're doing a film about this? Well, you really gotta do this, and you really gotta do this, and you really gotta do this. And of course, we roll our eyes and we say, thank you very much. Most of the things we don't do, but when Mel Brooks tells you, you not only have to do it, but clearly you had to include that in the film. Obviously, you didn't think about that in advance, but did 
was that in discussion in the editing room? Should we or should we not? Obviously, you had to. Well, we thought that we should do it, but something interesting was that in kind of earlier screenings of the film, we were really getting mixed reactions from people. A lot of people didn't like me being in the film and you know, we stuck with it, obviously. And we even put more of me in than what was originally there. But they're like, why do you need, they, they didn't see it. But it, we used humor as a strategy to try to keep this film entertaining and to maybe even allow it to reach a, a wider audience because, you know, we, wa we want to make a film that people are going to want to see and all kinds of people to see. Well, I thought it was a very good idea to have him and others ask you a question and have you answer it filmically and not answer it yourself. Does anybody agree? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is your first major film. What were you doing before and did you have a mentor? I see Peter Miller, wonderful filmmaker up there. H how did you get help making a film that looks very much like a seasoned filmmaker's film. Aw, thanks, Roger. <laughs> and I like how you called it major. <laughs> cool. So yes, I had some influences in making this film. Some of those films were Deli Man. And so I reached out to Eric, the director of that. And I loved the film, AKA Doc Pomus by uh, Peter. And so I reached out to him. And I've sort of always... Even though I'm a first time filmmaker, I got to work with some really experienced filmmakers along the way. And doing other production work, like freelance production work? No. I always had, you know, jo jobs in public relations or in arts administration, film festivals. Uh, so, you know, this was something I was doing evenings and weekends. And that's, you know, part of why it took the amount of time it did. And so no, the, but the, these experienced seasoned filmmakers that I got to work with, I was working with them on this film. The, I know the credit roll goes by pretty fast, but at least the, the names at the, the front, these are people who've made a, a lot of films and, you know, um, the, the, the score was composed by Mel's composer, Hummy Mann, who did Robin Hood, Men in Tights and Dracula Dead and Loving It. And, you know, it's, it's a really small world and it, it never hurts to ask and to keep asking. Uh, it wasn't a yes from everybody the first time. I had to wait years to get um, one of my editors, Michael Levine. And, um, you know, you just, be, I had to be patient. But I, I think that moving forward, you know, it probably won't take as long and it probably, it might not. It will. It'll, it will take as long. Okay. It will take as long. Okay. <laughs> But Don't keep tell going. Me that. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Yes. I'm curious how you made the connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Colin Powell. I had seen Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Russ and Daughters documentary. Oh shoot, what's it called right now? Okay, the Sturgeon Queens that was directed by. Julie Cohen, who uh, went on to, to, she's right now, her film Julia is out. And mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she's another person who's, she's in the thank you section because Julia, or sorry, not Julia, Julie watched, you know, early cuts of the, the film. And she, if I have even business questions, she's very, she's been a, um, that's, that's one other really, there's just something, documentary, it's been really, we want to help each other and I've been fortunate to find people who will answer my questions honestly and um, uh, kind of te te help me learn because I didn't go to film school. This was my film school. So, um, but that's how I saw Ruth Bader Ginsburg in um, Sturgeon Queens. And I thought, wow, if she ate at Russ and Daughter, she probably ate at Horn and Hard Art. Right. And so that's, I just wrote her a letter to and the Colin U.S. Powell? Supreme Court, like in, in the mail. I just, oh, you're kidding. I just mailed a letter to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was one Supreme Court, con I don't know, whatever the address. <laughs> and uh, she mailed me, she sent me a letter back. And uh, she said no, the first, she, her letter that she wrote me back said, you know, I, um, I have very good memories of going there. And I, you know, I, 
uh, but I don't think I have enough to say to make it worth your while to come all the way to DC. And, uh, and with Colin Powell, there's a Wikipedia page of famous people from New York. And so I found him on that list and I was thinking, you know, he's of the right generation. What would it hurt? So I mailed him a letter to his fan mail address. He wrote me back saying, a letter in the mail, you know, I have very fond memories of going there, but I don't think I would have enough to say. So then I started, I kind of, I got, the, I said, I'm coming to Inter Ginsburg. I'm coming to, I kind of, I played them against each I'm other. I'm doing Mel Brooks. That's very and, uh, smart. And then, uh, yeah, and Mel Brooks uh, You, you really song. have a lot of sophistication for somebody who started this film at 11 uh, <laughs> years old. Uh, so we, you know, we filmed, I think uh, Colin Powell was the, on a Thursday and then on a Friday uh, was uh, RBG. And that it was the week of I don't know if you remember during Trump's uh, campaign uh, when he he when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg spoke out against Trump and and then every, the media everybody the whole world came down on her saying you have no business you know speaking out about a uh, a presidential candidate and I interviewed her on the Friday of that week and I was the la her last appointment of the day it was like a four. 30 interview and I was just so afraid that she was going to cancel because it was such a bad week for her and in the end they did make some changes they said your mom can't come uh you we only we can't have you can't have a photographer in there uh we only can you only can bring in and this was at the last minute they sort of changed like you can only have the essential people in there and so it was me uh the cinematographer his wife they're a wonderful DC kind of popular duo they're the, a sound and camera team the husband wife loved it Alan i loved Moore. having getting uh, having it's hard it's hard to find um women um crew members um so whenever i had the option or the choice to do it i did in the back there was a question yes sir How long did it take you to, uh, eight and a half years yeah but it, again it was uh i was doing lots of other things at the same time but Ni I think Nigel, was, did yeah. you uh, do the finding of all the stock footage, or do you have somebody to do that for you? I was also the archival producer of this film, and I also um, I did it from start to finish. I also licensed all the the clips, and one people were telling me, you know, you shouldn't do it yourself. You're not going to be able to get the best rates, and I beg to differ. I I think that I wouldn't trust someone else to. I mean, uh, crying helps. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, yeah, there's no shame in begging. I mean, being a doc, it's, it's all glamorous sitting up here right now, but like you can't, there's so many hundreds of individual like photo and, you know, it's, it's messy making a historical, uh, film and, you know, I, uh, it's, it's a bit odd. It was, a, it, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it, also I wasn't setting out to make a, a, it was, it started off as like a little two or three minute short, um, that, that I made for this college class. And well so. done. Another question, Dorothy. Ah, uh, yes. So I had a lot of help on that. Uh, we have a Facebook page that has a lot of really passionate, the people who love Horn and Hardart who have fought, who are following the page and who comment and whatever. So people would just, you know, message me or post, hey, I was watching TCM today and I, I saw the film in Easy, you know, so... And uh, there, people had already on YouTube put together compilations of automat scenes. And I mean, to this day, I keep finding out about new ones because there, there's, I think we've found like 40. And there were earlier cuts of the film that had many more than this. And we, it didn't work to have them all. Uh, we also, in earlier cuts of the film, kept all the clips chronologically and that wasn't working. But um, I mean, the, the kind of beautiful irony is that the film was uh, picked up by TCM and it's going to start um, airing on TCM in September. Fantastic. Fantastic. Tell everybody you've ever known. <laughs> What's your next film going to be? <laughs> My next film is a rom-com set in Italy called, uh, well, I won't get it, but it's, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, 
I'm really excited for this new challenge to do something that can leverage all this experience and then push me in a, a whole different direction. And if anyone's interested in investing in that next film, uh, it's that's sort of why in, we it's invited in, it's in you vein, here today. It's in the vein of my big fat Greek wedding, and um, I'd love to. Right. Even if you don't want, for, if you don't want to invest in the film, that's fine. But I afterwards, I'm going to stick around and I'll, I'll be here. Uh, I'm going to see some other films at the festival. So if anyone's here and wants to talk, uh, I'm, I don't bite. Like my film on Thursday, next Thursday, 6 o'clock, The Shorts, The Soul of a Farmer. Oh, well. Um, talk about uh, funding. I saw you did a, a Kickstarter. What was your goal and how did you do? I think the goal was 60000 or 50000 and we exceeded our goal at like last minute it was uh that was really intense and stressful and i'm not gonna lie i had one of my uh, arts administration jobs that i got fired from that month uh because i was so focused on my you know i was raising money for my film only to get fired from my uh source of income uh but it cost a lot more than six sixty thousand. where <laughs> did you do grants did you do what, what where did you it's a tough job fundraising. I know. It is. So there were some foundations and individuals, and it it wasn't easy as a first-time filmmaker to be able to get grants. I, d I didn't get very many. Uh, it's not easy as an experienced filmmaker. It's yeah. Film, it's, grants is hard. Grants is hard. One more question, all the way in the back. In your earlier version, did you use the clip from Midnight Cowboy? The Horn and Hard Rock clip from Midnight Cowboys. Oh, actually, I, I think that one is, is, I'm not familiar with that. So I'll have to try to find it. The Midnight Cowboy, no. Back to the editing room. Lisa Hurwitz, thank you very much.